Greetings. Hey, thanks for being here. It's the Business of Agriculture podcast. I'm Damian Mason, your host, but you already knew that because you heard that in the introduction. Got a great show for you today. I've got the author of The Demise of Free Trade. Her name is Michelle Klieger. We're going to talk a lot about trade, trade as it relates to agriculture, trade as it relates to the United States of America and our future. Before we get into that, a reminder that this is not only an audio podcast, this is also a video podcast. Please go to the Damian Mason YouTube channel. The playlist is Business of Agriculture, and check it out there. You'll see video, you'll see our bright, smiling faces, and also please hit subscribe when you're at YouTube because the more people that subscribe, the more people then will be finding our message because you know how that works. It's all about the algorithms. The Business of Agriculture podcast, this episode anyhow, as well as many of the most recent episodes, is brought to you by my good friends at Harvest Profit. Harvest Profit is a company that was started by a guy named Nick Horeb up in Fargo, North Dakota. It doesn't matter where it is because their clients are all over North America, 24 states and six provinces. Wait a minute, I always get that wrong. It's 26 states and four provinces. Okay, Canada, pick up your game. We need more provinces. United States of America, you're doing a good job. Okay, Harvest Profit is a software solution company for managing your inputs and your outputs, your inventory, marketing your grain. If you run your business off of like a Pioneer Seed Corn uh, pamphlet like they gave you at a trade show in 1984, it's time to get with the times, right? Get your HarvestProfit.com subscription. You can go and you can use their product as a free trial for 14 days. Go to HarvestProfit.com. All right. I talk a lot about trade. I got Michelle Kluger here and she's been sitting patiently here while I'm talking and I'm now want to hear from her. Michelle, welcome to the Business of Agriculture. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. All right, I'm going to go ahead and point out that this is not the first time we've talked. It's not even the first time we've talked via Zoom, because for those of you that do not know Michelle, she's a smart lady. She's got uh, all sorts of accolades, like like basically like she tested out of what my degree is. That's like how smart this chick is. Okay, Michelle, give us your background in a nutshell. Um, so I do. I went to the same school as you did. I went to Purdue. I got a master's in agriculture econ and an MBA from Indiana University. I worked in DC in agriculture and trade policy for about a decade. And two years ago, I moved to New England and started a consulting firm. And the interesting thing is, you're not even really like most people in the business of ag uh, come from it. And you're not really from it, right? I am not, which has actually been an interesting conversation I've had a few times recently. I grew up in Florida on the beach, uh, wanted to be a veterinarian, wildlife veterinarian. The closest I had to agriculture was my father and grandfather had a meat business. I had a uh, green market stand before people really bought meat outside at local markets and got up every Saturday to help do that. But rode horses occasionally and was interested in being a vet. Went to a land grant university. I went to the University of Maryland for animal sciences and then never made it to veterinary school. My buddy that's a veterinarian, a retired veterinarian claims he always had uh, teenage girls that wanted to work in his vet office as, you know, just uh, interns. And I said, why is it? And he said, Mason, every girl that read Black Beauty uh, or rode a horse thinks they're going to become a veterinarian. And I said, oh, okay. So he wasn't even being mean. I think there's actually a very accurate statement there. So Michelle Klieger is the author of The Demise of Free Trade. She's a smart woman. She keeps up with agricultural stuff. You should follow her on LinkedIn. Uh, just look up Michelle Klieger. That's where uh, I think she and I were introduced by some joint, uh, some from mutual friends. And, uh, and she and I have, have kept up with some other communication. I said, you should be on this podcast because I want to talk to you about trade. Now, here's the thought, dear listener. If you have been in my audience or if you've been listening to this, you might have heard some remnants of what I'm going to tell you. The United States of America, agriculture has always looked at trade as our silver bullet. We are an export-oriented agricultural industry because we only have 330 million people here in our own country and we produce enough abundance for roughly about a billion and a half, a billion and two. We, we produce at least enough food really, depending on which commodity you're talking about, for about four times what our population maybe is, maybe five times. We need trade. No disputing on that. The thing is, and I've been hearing this since I was a kid, Feed the world, feed the world, feed the world, feed the world. We thought it was incumbent upon us to go out and just grow as much stuff as we could, produce as much stuff as we could, and by God, we'd figure out a way to find a barge, stick it on that barge, and ship it to somewhere around the world where we were feeding the world. Okay, 
The rest of the world has learned to feed themselves. Not being mean, they just caught up. Frankly, they caught up because we taught them how. Uh, and also, their economics have improved. And when, when food improves, economics improve, and then one goes hand in hand with the other. Right now, we still need trade, but trade is not gonna bring back $9 be uh, corn or $7 corn or $19 soybeans or any of those pipe dreams that we have. So, that being said, we still need trade, we cannot depend on trade. And now I'm gonna ask Michelle, are we even gonna have free trade? Talk to me. We are definitely moving away from it and we have been for a while now. So that was really the premise of, my, of the book I wrote and published last summer was trade is in the news a lot more. Um, it was sort of just something that everybody agreed on from World War II uh, until um, five years ago or so, there's been a lot more concern, right? There was a general consensus, um, support of the World Trade Organization, um, proliferation of free trade agreements. Both Republican and Democratic presidents really did move free trade agreements forward um, at different times. And there's always some pushback from labor and other par parties about um, exporting not just products, but also exporting jobs. Uh, so that really has been the major pushback. Um, but there's been a change, and I would say throughout the current administration, of where is trade and what are the terms of trade. So, you know, really re-looking at what the agreements we have signed are and trying to figure out maybe a way to do it better or have a more critical conversation about trade. It's interesting because uh, I already gave the example about North American agriculture. We, we really only hit that position maybe about a decade, about a century ago, early 19, uh, you know, 1920s, let's call it 100 years ago, when we started producing such abundance that we had more, our country was just growing by leaps and bounds, you know, Ellis Island, and, uh, you know, we're bringing over Asian immigrants uh, to do our, build our railroads and all that in the late 1800s. Then by the early 1900s, 1920s, let's say, we got through World War I, and we were relatively unscathed. We only fought that war for about a year, whereas the European countries fought it for four years. And the, the line never moved more than a few miles, but they sure mustered gas the hell out of their residence. They destroyed farmland. They destroyed the uh, infrastructure. So all of a sudden, we're coming out really, you know, smelling like daisies, so to speak. And now we've got abundance of food because we've got growth in technology. We've got urbanization. We've got rapid innovation going on in agriculture. And then we really started becoming more of an export country by then. And then, of course, it happened again in post-World War II because about the same story. We were left unscathed. We lost some humans, but we did not just lose our, our infrastructure in our country. So we're really talking about then from the, even it was a protectionist time in terms of um, the Cold War began and all those things, we really opened up the sieve of free trade 1950s, right? Yes, for sure. And we, you know, we, came at it at a very you know well thought out approach i mean the goal was that we didn't want to occupy europe that we wanted europe to go i mean we still had that isolationist tendencies right we wanted europe to go back to being europe and we wanted to go back to being on our side of the atlantic and one of the things to stabilize was to have more trade and that's really where the ideas of having being economically interdependent came from in this idea that if you are dependent on your neighbors and if you're trading with your neighbors and if you're you know working with them and meeting them in such a way that there's going to be less of these barriers and we're going to through communication through interrelated economies continue to work together um, as opposed to a more antagonistic approach so I remember thinking that uh, that um, that very thing about the 1990s when I'm graduating from Purdue in 1992 that, you know, really, this is probably all good that we're uh, getting more interdependent because we live in a global economy. And and that means that, we you know, when 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 vessels carrying merchandise go across the water, gunships don't. I remember that reading that, you know, loud and clear. But what we really learned, though, Michelle, is that. Sometimes, because countries still are aggressive, they still have um, imperialistic tendencies and they still have conquest issues um, because countries are made up of people and people have those issues themselves, um, and particularly politicians. Uh, it turns out that trade became a new weapon. And I'm not sure if you're gonna give me the commentary on that that I'm gonna deliver, but I have a feeling I wanna hear yours. 
trade becomes a weapon. Uh, what happened with us getting sideways with China? Trade becomes a weapon. Uh, what happened, even NAFTA, signed in 1994 between us, Canada, and Mexico, it got contentious. Is trade the new, is the trade the new bullet? Is trade the new uh, gentleman's form of nuclear weapon? I think that it definitely has the possibility in the short term because it's so disruptive, but I think that it's not necessarily a nuclear weapon because countries and people and economies evolve. So, I mean, we have very quickly seen when, you know, you talk about it all the time, right? That soybeans are a global market. And so when soybeans stopped moving from our Midwest to China, they started going from other places. And so it's actually really neat. You can watch the ships move around the ocean now. And so it's really a redistribution. So I don't know that it is a mutually assured destruction because as much as we say that right now, agriculture lacks resiliency, which I think is debatable, I, there's enough resiliency in our international systems and in our internet and, and in our own countries to adjust, but there would be a pain period. By the way, as you pointed out, I do say it all the time and I have got people really wound up at me that don't, uh, don't really do well with economics when I say, okay, so if we opened up trade deals with China again, does that mean you're going to bring back $11 beans? Are they going to hang around $8 and 60 cents where they are right now? Well, yeah, bring it back. I said, no, it wouldn't because it's a global supply and people really struggle with that. Uh, speaking of which, uh, I've been pretty anti China. And I put out a video that you watched, I know, and I'm going to share a briefly a little bit of it with our listeners right now here on the Business of Agriculture podcast. But before I do that, I want to remind you that this podcast is brought to you by Harvest Profit. That's right. Harvest Profit is a software solution for your farm, for your agricultural enterprise. Uh, input, output, inventory, grain marketing, all the stuff, all the money stuff. I know you're an ag person. You like to talk about beef and beans and all that kind of stuff. But behind, at the end of the day, you don't have a lifestyle. You don't have your passion. Everybody in this industry is so passionate, remember. You don't have your passion on your lifestyle if you don't have a business. So to keep your business going, you need a software solution like Harvest Profit. Go to harvestprofit.com. Check out Nick Horeb's company. He's also got a great uh, blog article series in there you can check out. Do it. Get a 14-day free trial. Make your business move forward. Okay. I said in this thing, Michelle, that the China not buying Tyson chicken had nothing to do with the fact that some worker in Springdale, Arkansas, a month and a half ago, touched a package with his fingers. And they said, oh, that's what China said. They said, we're not going to bring in your chicken because of uh, coronavirus. What's the real reason that China did that? Because I think you agree with me. Um, I did agree with you. I did not think of it by myself. So I will say that for sure. Um, I do think that it is an interesting calculation that the Department of Justice and Tyson's cut a deal in the price fixing. So Tyson's uh, exposure to retaliation, punishment, whatever, is really limited. However, Smithfield, which is owned by China, by China or Chinese companies, um, will be part of this price fixing lawsuit. And I do think that China makes very calculated and strategic decisions. So I thought that that was a really interesting angle. And I think that even as the announcements have expanded, as China has said no to or needs certificates on soybeans from both the United States and Brazil and um, meat from, from Germany. So we're seeing it in a lot of different places. So I, I don't know. I feel like I do go to LinkedIn and ask questions as much as I like to, you know, give my opinions that, you know, is it that they have enough of these beans and feet meat now that they're recovering from ASF? Is it that they're trying to push any second wave onto other countries so that they can remove the blame? Like, I just, I know that there's a reason going on and it's kind of interesting to hear how other people have come up with some of those options. Dear listener, if you don't know what ASF is that she just used, that's African swine fever. If you haven't paid attention to my stuff, you can go back and look. You can go on YouTube, in fact, as I told you to go to my channel. And you can go on, uh, there's a playlist called Agricultural Commentary. And I have the, it's titled Protein and a Protracted Trade War with China. It's what decided, made me decide to have Michelle on here. She's the author of The Demise of Free Trade. Okay, talking about China. Um, we got too dependent on them, this is my assertion. 
Uh, ag in North America did exactly what ag in North America does. We just concentrated on production. How many bushels a week can we get out of that field? How many pounds can we throw on that steer at that feed yard out there in Kansas? How many, how many pounds of cotton can, you know, bales of cotton can we grab out of that uh, Texas farm? And you know what? We're just going to keep shipping to China, 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 China. Remember, it was about 10 years ago, National Geographic did an entire episode, entire uh, issue about China and their amazing growth, their amazing state orchestrated version of capitalism and what it did for their economy and then their consumptive habits. There we were, the supplier of beans and cotton and everything else. And now they hold us hostage because really they say, you can't live without us. That's what happened. Is that the reason free trade goes away? I think that it was maybe. Um, I also would like to throw out another idea option. Um, and I just think that American companies got tired of playing by Chinese rules in China or having an unfair system. And so this was our chance to also put pressure on China and say, look, you set up a system where you're dependent on importing soybeans. You produce these other crops by yourself. We're going to put pressure on you because we want you to play by the same rules. Our companies want to have the same rules in China as your companies have. Um, you're not 25 years behind anymore. That's not an excuse to steal intellectual property. So on our side, I think it's both. I think we felt like we had some leverage to say, look, negotiations, having these discussions, bilaterals, weren't getting us where we wanted to get on these political or, you know, other policies, these non-tariff policies. So let's try something else. And, you know, you need our soybeans. We're going to try we're going to put these tariffs on um, and maybe that will force some change. Yeah. And, and you and I talked before we started recording. Uh, we know that China cheats. We know that China never has ever uh, held up any part of any end of their uh, bargain. They've never done it. They haven't. When we, uh, you know, the Trump administration, it doesn't matter the administration, uh, but we got really excited and said, yep, that's right. They're going to buy $50 billion worth of our stuff. Three years ago was the record year, the record, record year that China ever bought, and they bought $24 billion worth of agricultural products. So we're supposed to believe that they're going to more than double their annual consumption of our stuff, annual purchases. We don't care whether they, can, whether they consume it or not. They can buy it and dump it in the ocean. We just said buys. We're, we were stupid. I'm not stupid. You know, it's the old thing. Are you stupid or naive? Uh, you know, some people say things very idealistic. Are you stupid or are you naive? I don't think that agricultural people are stupid. I will say that we were a little naive if we truly believed that China would buy $50 billion worth of stuff. Again, at lowest prices. There you go. So I, I never thought that they would, and obviously they're not. And then they're using it now as a, they, they love, what they are essentially is, they're like the fat guy at the cafeteria that thinks the cafeteria can't exist without them. And the reality is, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, thinner consumers out there that we can live with. We can live without them, and they do love to throw their weight around. That's really all they have. All they really have is size. And so we have um, we've gotten too dependent on them. We know that, but also they never were going to hold up any part of their agreement anyhow. Do you see them ever actually come back to the table and doing what they say? Well, I first think that by just picking a dollar amount and saying that they were going to buy more, that's something they wanted to agree to. Buying more is the game that they've been playing, right? You said we've become dependent on them because they're willing to buy more of our stuff. Buying more didn't change biotech approval processes. Buying more didn't change intellectual property stuff. And those were the points that we were trying to address. So by putting tariffs on to induce structural changes. We didn't get structural changes. We got what they wanted to give us was we'll buy more and we're going to structure it in a way where we might buy more, right? It said you have, it has to be market competitive. It has to be, you know, reasonable. And so there were enough outs even before COVID to really question the possibility, but I still don't think we got what we wanted out of it, which was these other changes. Yeah, I had a client that asked me if they could give me a contract for a December date, and uh, we said, sure, absolutely. And then they said, only thing is we need a condition that uh, we're not, 
uh, held liable if we don't actually have our meeting and we uh, we have the right to cancel at any time and we can't give you any money until uh, you're actually there. And I said, well, that doesn't really sound like a contract. <laughs> doesn't really sound like a deal. So anyway, um, that's kind of what China did. We're going to buy $50 billion worth of your stuff. Uh, if, 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 and if, which means none of those things will ever align. So they've got their out and we all jump for joy and said, see, they're going to buy our crap. And then as you pointed out, they, they whether we do, do tariffs or not, doesn't prevent them from uh, stealing our intellectual property. In fact, we stupidly went over there uh, as a American companies and gave them our intellectual property as a condition of doing business. Uh, and, and we shouldn't have. And ownership. I mean, to do business in China, you need to have a joint venture and you only get 49% of your company. Yeah. So I think it, it was, this is a really a bad, we, we made a lot of bad decisions as a country and as an economy. And, and it's not just agriculture. And frankly, most of it wasn't agriculture. The demise of free trade. Okay. What happens also? Let's not stop talking about China because I'm tired of hearing about those communist bastards. Let's talk about other companies, other countries. I'm sorry, uh, other countries. Um, does the North American Free Trade Agreement revisal called USMCA, right? United States, Mexico, Canada agreement. Does it, does it get all done and, and does it do well for us? Well, I think it's interesting that you asked that question this week when we're talking about new tariffs on Canada. So, I mean, to say that we're going to move forward with a new free trade agreement that we spent two years negotiating, um, I don't know that we've gotten anywhere if before it's even fully in force and everybody's following it, we're talking about new tariffs again. So the there's reason still a lot of tension on the borders. There's a, there's a lot of tension on it. You know, if you talk to a Canadian agricultural producer or, or even agricultural industry uh, insider, whatever, we have con listeners up there. Welcome, Canada. I'm the only American you know who can name every single province, including Nunavut. Uh, so anyway, welcome, Canada. The Canadians would tell you, you know what? The problem with us signing up with this is, like you said previously, Michelle, well, if we're economically interdependent, then we're not going to become uh, at war. Well, the Canadians are going to say, you've got more people in California than we have in our entire country. You could, you could glut us with your country's milk, let's say, and bankrupt all Canadian dairy farmers, and then a year later, we have no choice but to buy our dairy products from you. So that's why they prop up through the supply management system, their dairy industry. I don't fault Canada because they look at it as a, a level of food autonomy. That to me is why we will never have free trade completely because there's going to be other countries that look to that exact model like Canada and say, if we don't do a certain few things, we will lose food autonomy and then we will absolutely be dependent on the hand that feeds us and we will never be able to bite them. And most countries probably don't want to be in that situation, especially if they're a G8 higher uh, uh, income, uh, higher GDP per capita type country. Am I allowed to ask questions or only you? You can do whatever you want because remember, you're kind of my pet now after we've been doing these calls together, yes. So my question, so sort of along that, right, you're saying, you know, the interdependence. So the United States can definitely produce enough food to feed itself, but are we, have we become dependent on our trading partners that give us specialty products year round? So how do you think Americans will feel if they can't have, one, if you had to explain to them why they couldn't have grapes in the winter or bananas ever? So are we not on a like sustenance level, but just on a level of comfort dependent on our partners? Well, I remember they call it the first world problems, right? Those are first world problems, Michelle. Uh, I said that a long time ago, uh, eat local movement because that became very big. Eat local, eat local, eat local. And then the foodie crowd and the environmental crowd said, you know, you're doing the, uh, the environment a disservice if you're not eating local. I'm like, well, I'm not sure that's necessarily true because the economics of producing lettuce in Yuma uh, beat the hell out of the economics of producing lettuce and say, uh, uh, you know, central Minnesota. So it's probably still from an economic standpoint and a utilization of the resource, et cetera, et cetera. So as I always pointed out about eat local was um, eat local sounds great until you're craving a chocolate dipped banana in Cleveland in February. Um, you know, good luck finding those cocoa, uh, cocoa farms and good luck finding those, um, those banana farms, plantations. Um, we definitely have enough product we can feed ourselves but the American consumer probably would not stand for it. The day that the American consumer goes to Whole Foods, I'm talking about, of course, a more affluent consumer, and there's no kumquats, 
in January, they're going to say, where the hell are the kumquats? I always come here and get my kumquats. Well, it's January. We don't even really grow kumquats in the United States of America, let alone in the dead of winter. Well, I don't care. I want my kumquats. So it's kind of like the quarantine thing, Michelle. Can you live on canned food for three months in your house? You sure as hell can. Do you want to? Most Americans do not and have the means that they don't have to. So are we dependent on them? Less than they are generally on us. Because when you have money, you have power. So I would say that the United States is always in a position that we can throw money at something and get what we want. I know that I do say, I know why Canada wants to, even if it requires propping up, that's how they sell it. They'll prop up the poultry industry through subsidies. And by the way, we prop up stuff also. Again, no offense, Canada. Only American can name all of your provinces. Nova Scotia, Newfoundland. I went to Manitoba in January this year. So anyway, um, well, when you get to be as famous as me, they take me up there all the time. Usually between November and February, I'm good for a few Canadian gigs in places that like are two hours drive from the airport in the dead of winter in a blizzard. Um, so what I, I do understand why they do it. We prop up our ag sector. We just don't do it through supply management, but they do it because they want to preserve some level of independence and food autonomy. And, you know, it takes a wealthy country to do that. That's the other thing. You talk about the demise of free trade. If you were in an African country, I can't remember the exact ones that produce most of the cocoa. There's like four countries that produce the majority of the world's cocoa, as I remember reading. They don't really have a choice. They have no choice but to participate in trade because that's their income. That is the revenue. Where They're not selling Audis and, uh, and uh, Tiffany's and uh, Nike's. You know, just, They have one thing to sell. So a rubber producing country, a cocoa producing country, they can't, they don't even have the economic luxury of reducing trade because it's all they have. Whereas a country like Canada or the United States can use that as a, uh, as a threat. So and did you back see to your what a problem that is now with all the duty free shop, there's a 1.3, I think it is billion dollar backlog of chocolate because nobody's buying Toblerone. All because they, you know, they don't go through airports where all that crap gets sold. And by the way, again, talking to my Canadian friends, they're masterful. I mean, those Canadians, they play nice. Oh, yeah, just, oh, yeah, don't you know, hey, whatever. But by God, they will make you at, at the Edmonton or Calgary airport, maybe both, I can't remember, they make you walk for about a half mile through duty-free shops just to get to your plane. Like, like it's the, the, the whole hallway is just duty-free shops. I mean, it's remarkable how, how good they are at huckstering stuff to you and telling you it's duty-free. So anyway, your big question, are we dependent on them because we want kumquats in January? Yes. Um, is it the same kind of dependence? Absolutely not. Because certainly uh, the, the, the person in India that's just starting to make good money that can just now start to buy food, they're not as picky about whether they get kumquats. They're just happy to have calories. So it's a different level of dependence. And you talked about something interesting about China and the demise of free trade. And you said about GMOs. Now, what generally has happened is countries have used reluctance or resistance to a product category as an excuse. Europe said, we can't bring in stuff that's genetically modified. And then they pretended it was because their consumers didn't want GMO foods. And the reality is BASF and Bayer at the time didn't have GMO technology figured out the way Monsanto did in American companies. So it was a bit of protectionism. A lot of times we pretend it's about the consumer when it's really about big corporate interests and protectionism. Am I right? Yeah. And I think that most people would argue that that's where China is too, that they are slow on biotech approvals because they are building up their own industry. And when you have conversations about it, they say, you know, our corn genetics are 25 years behind yours. So it's not stealing. We're just using yours for research. So I think that it is time on their side in order to, you know, build up their industry and get it there. And I think that's why there may be more willingness to work in a gene editing space because their research institutions are very invested in moving forward a lot in this space. So if they can come out ahead, then they are willing to. And I think that's one of the things I've always enjoyed about my many trips back and forth between the United States and China is that I always got the impression that China was going to keep working and keep 
they wanted to eventually be competitors with the United States. There are a lot of countries that are like, look, our livestock genetics are where they are, our corn genetics are where they are. You know what? We get by, we get by. But China has always felt like they really wanted to become equal and then compete. And as we get closer to that, I think where you're going to see more and more of this tension. I believe it's more than that. I believe it's more sinister than that, frankly. I don't think they want to compete with us. I think they want to replace us. And I talked about that in that video I put out. Dear listener, go check it out. It's called Protein and a Protracted Trade War. Remember, China is spending almost $2 trillion dollars on the new Belt and Road Initiative, which means they're going to third world countries and through what we'll call wand diplomacy, meaning they give money to these countries, but really then they're just building harbors, rail and uh, railways and highways so that they can then extract mineral resources and of course agricultural resources from those countries. So it's actually uh, a form of, uh, it's a form of uh, uh, colonialism, if you will, imperialism. Okay, the demise of free trade. Give me the top couple of takeaways so that my listeners can pick up this book. What are the couple things? There's no, there's never going to be trade again. Come on, Michelle, you're being crazy. No, of course there's going to be trade. Um, no, I, I think that it showed the point of the book was really so that um, your listeners could understand and have uh, a basic introduction. So, right. So not everybody has written uh, as extensively or read extensively on the formation of the World Trade Organization in view or, you know, how the president gets his power. So understanding where the president gets the power to make trade agreements, understanding how this interdependent works, how a tariff itself works. I mean, who is actually paying the tariffs? Those were really the takeaways I wanted uh, to m help people get through because you know, it is an important topic right now. And whether we move forward with more trade or less trade, I think does impact everyone. But we really think that it only impacts people that are exporting grain when we all, you know, have benefits and as well as negative impacts of trade. So like uh, the thing with uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, it was it was never going to happen whether Trump or Hillary got elected in 2016. Both of them vowed to get out of it. I actually didn't think it was the greatest deal in the world, except that we did need to have a presence with a lot of those uh, Pacific countries and did open up the door for to us to be sort of now uh, cast away, cast aside out of the whole thing. Uh, what happens moving forward? Do we do we end up having good? You know, our, our Japan, I think that my personal feeling is Japan's going to ramp up and, and uh, we're going to do better with them as the China situation continues to sour. I think that Japan has been trying to warn us that the, that the China situation was going to shower, was going to sour, and that that was a chance to work together to be a stronger alliance. And you've seen that a lot in the last week or so, you know, speculation on where China sits on our elections and that China, you know, the theory is, or the most common one I've seen, is that China is afraid that we'll go back to that alliance. Will we go back to working with China or Japan and the European Union to put on some of this international pressure or are we going to do it ourselves? And so, I mean, for me, I think that that's what TPP was. It was an opportunity to work together. There was specific language in there that addressed the state-owned enterprises in China. And so it really, that was a, I am concerned about a stronger relationship with Japan at this point because we did pull out when we were partners with them. Yeah, I, I think it ultimately will happen. And just like I think it's going to happen with Europe, uh, it's going to happen with Great Britain first because there they are dangling in the ocean. So I think it's going to happen with them. Then it'll happen with the EU. And we're going to really probably get more aligned that way. And I think it's time that we do understand that China cheats on everything and they're not uh, they're, they're not going to be our answer. And I don't think they, uh, I'm thinking that we, uh, we can just move right along on that one. So for the person listening to this, let's say the person listening to this is a guy that sells seed or a woman that uh, is in agricultural finance. She's saying, why do I care about this? Why do they care about this? Well, as you mentioned, we do export 140 roughly billion dollars worth of agriculture commodities a year, everything from grain to, you know, commodities to specialty products. So I don't think you can find a state in the union that hasn't been affected by the reduction of trade, um, especially in agriculture, we're, we're really good at it, right? You talked about maximizing 
you know, yields or conversion ratios, like we're really good at it and we have good transportation and infrastructure to get our products out. So agriculture is an easy target for everybody. And that's what we've seen. We've seen Kentucky bourbon getting attacked. We've seen soybeans. We've seen, you know, Maine lobsters and, you know, almonds from California. So I think that agriculture cares about trade because we're good at it. And no matter who actually should be targeted, agriculture has a really easy mark on its back to be targeted by counter tariffs. Yeah, and it seems like uh, they keep saying, and this is what was always interesting to me, and this will be our last point, uh, the media picked up on this. Well, they're doing this just to, to target Trump's base. I'm like, somebody needs to give you some numbers. There's only, there's only 3.2 million farmers in the United States of America. And then another, granted, it was all affiliated ag people, but the media never quite figured that out. They keep saying, well, if China figures they're going to harm farmers and that way it will harm Trump. I'm like, that's a few million. Uh, that's, out of, that's less than 1% of the population. So I think that's uh, probably not the real deal. Although, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that have a lot of emotion with that. All right. What else do our people need to know that are involved in agriculture? We do need trade. Uh, you say it's not going to be free. Does that just mean there's always going to be a fight? Because there always has been. From the time I was a kid, there's been a fight. I was there for the grain embargo in 1980 that Jimmy Carter put in. Uh, I've, I've been around this for a long time. Always going to be a fight? I think that there's... Maybe. I think that there's a good chance that there's a fight for the exact reason you said with Canada, that food, and for anybody that has worked in agriculture knows how personal food is and how, for, from a government's perspective, how important food security is. Um, you know, I, people say all the time, you're five meals away from total chaos. If you didn't eat for five meals or your child or spouse didn't eat for five meals, like, what would you be willing to do? So from a food security standpoint, being able to control your own food supply and feed your people is absolutely critical. Um, and then just, we like it. I mean, we have so much around our food. You know, we have cheeses or a special recipe or something that we're so connected and we feel like is so much part of our history. And People want to understand where their food comes from, and they don't. They want to understand how their food is made. And it's not like we all have little gardens and you go out and pick your squash. Uh, it is a complicated system. And so I think that food will always be a touchy su subject because it's so personal and it's just so important to life. I pointed that out in this book called Food Fear. If you haven't picked up your copy, I encourage you to do so. It's about the business of food and agriculture. And as I point out, it is exactly as Michelle just teed it up for me right there, that food has become a weapon. Because remember, if you're a country that can hold back or you're a country that can say, you know what, we're not going to buy your Jim Beam because we're going to punish you or we're going to do this or that. And that's been going on for, for quite some time, actually. Her book's called The Demise of Free Trade. Are you going to pick up a copy and hold it up? I mean, I just did it. You don't even have one sitting on your desk right now, do you? How poor of a marketer are you? I just was telling everybody we have this on video. How long is it going to take you to go and grab your copy? No. <laughs> All right. So her, her book is called The Demise of Free Trade. Her name is Michelle Klieger. She does her best work over on LinkedIn. Uh, where else can these people find you? Uh, Twitter and um, occasionally Facebook, but I'm not such a fan. So mostly Twitter, and I have a website. I have two websites, michellekleger.com and my consulting business, stratagerm.com. My name is Damian Mason. I'm Michelle Klieger. The sponsor of this episode is my good friend, Nick Horeb, but don't look him up, although he's on those social media formats also. His name is Nick Horeb, H-O-R-O-B, but his company is called Harvest Profit. You can check them out at harvestprofit.com, and you can also find them on social media. If you want to make your ag enterprise more profitable, if you want to have visibility into your cost of production, field by field, even landlord, landlord by landlord, if you're a farmer and you're not using harvestprofit.com, you're missing out. It's about profitability. It's about management. It's about understanding your numbers because you are a business after all. Check out harvestprofit.com and see what they can do for you. Incidentally, we never even got into the, this, uh, this angle here about uh, how trade uh, facilitates class warfare maybe you come back for another episode you want to do that i'm willing to do that she's awesome all right check her out on social media she's got good stuff and until next time it's the business of agriculture thanks for being here